Well, today is the sixth Sunday of Easter, and uh, our text is John 15, verses 9 through 17. Before I start, I need to say a little something about the background I used on the PowerPoint today. I, I, I try to look for a fresh one when we were preparing sermons, and that chosen on there, it came with it. I added the rest, but I got to looking at that, and I was asking Beverly which one she liked. She said, well, I like this one. We talked a while. She says, well, why did you select that one to consider? And I didn't think about it, so I started thinking about it. And here's what it is. It represents the church who is the chosen of God. Every size, color, and shape you can imagine. And they're all jammed in there together. And look at all the drip and stuff on the outside. It's messy. <laughs> Isn't that the church? <laughs> That's the church. Today we're going to talk about the subject of being chosen. Now, <clears throat> I remember one of my first days at Valdosta Middle School back in the 50s and it was recess, and we were choosing up sides to play softball. And the two biggest guys, of course, declared themselves to be the captain of the two teams, and so they started picking from among us. They flipped a coin, and you know, one picking, and then the other. I was a newcomer. I don't. I, that was my first year at that school. I didn't know anybody. I was kind of by myself. And one by one, they picked one, and this one picked one, and this one picked one. And find out I was the only one left. They had to pick me. Man, I tell you, it was like jabbing a sword in my heart. To this very day, I remember how important it was for me to feel included, valued, chosen. I mean, be, being chosen uh, was only part of it. There was also uh, what you were chosen for. You see, the captain also directed what position you play. And I always, they always put me in right field. And you know why? Because most everybody bats right-handed. And you're more likely to pull the ball and hit to this half of the field than that. So that's where I play. And I never saw much action except the time or two I got to bat. Choice is important to us, feeling valued and included. Choice is also an important subject in Christian faith. Sermon invitations often ask people to make a choice, a decision for, or to choose Christ. And I do it myself. <laughs> but it, such seems to ignore a very important truth that Jesus makes clear in our text. Now let's listen to the text. John 15, beginning at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've kept the Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this, so my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made complete. <clears throat> My command is this, love each other as I've loved you. Greater love have no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. But all that I've learned from the Father, Jesus said, I've given to you. Whew. You did not choose me. I chose you. I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. And now, Father, we ask, that you would bury this text in our hearts and it would bear fruit in our lives. 
Amen. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me. I chose you. Now, <coughs> of course, every person does have to decide whether or not they're going to accept the invitation that's been offered to play on Jesus' team. But the important message is uh, without Jesus, we wouldn't have any choice at all. His choice is first. Accepting Christ is really accepting the fact that God has accepted you. To make a decision for Christ is to accept God's choosing us to be his children. We are the chosen. Well, why did God choose us? I'm not going to read uh, Corinthians uh, 1, 27, 29, but I'm going to move part of it to you. He says this, God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and things that aren't, that are, that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Sometimes I think we need to have that tattooed on our arm or something so we can just read it as we go. It would help us keep our egos in check, wouldn't it? God chose you. But your abilities and your skills and all that, that's not really what God's concerned about. Now Jesus says that he loves us as the Father loved him. But we know from other texts that God loves everyone. But not everyone is chosen. The sole criterion for God's choosing us it's his foreknowledge that we would say yes to his choosing. Read Romans 8 this afternoon. God foreknew who would say yes. And he has preordained them for a role in his kingdom. Our ability is of no concern to God. Only our availability. Will we say yes to his offer? to play on his team. We still have the choice, but we would have none at all if he hadn't chose us. <coughs> now, though God chooses us for a purpose in this world, the ultimate destiny of creation does not depend upon our puny power, our finite wisdom, and our limited ability, but solely upon the sovereign power of God, the infinite wisdom, and the unlimited ability of God. So we don't have to sweat the job's too big because you've got a big God standing behind you. Whatever God calls you to do, you can do, and you can do it well. Well, what are we chosen for? <laughs> now, there's a large overarching purpose for which we are chosen. And I'll get to that at the end of the sermon. But there are other things for which we are chosen that are enumerated in our text. These are things that must happen in us and through us if we're going to fulfill this overarching purpose. Now, I mentioned these things last Sunday. We dealt with this part of the same text, but in a little different context. First of all, look at verse 10. He says, if you keep my commands, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. So we were chosen for obedience to Christ. Jesus is the coach, the head coach. We are the players. That means Jesus determines who plays what position. It means that Jesus sets our schedule, determines our strategy, presents the game plan, and then calls the plays. He's the head dog. He, he's the coach. We simply obey, execute those commands. 
Verse 11. He said, I've told you this so my joy may be complete in you. You've been chosen for joy. You've been chosen for joy. When Demas Sicarian wrote the book about the full gospel business fellowship that he had started, you know what he called the name of the book? What he titled it? The Happiest People on Earth. <laughs> Christians ought to be the happiest people on earth. We've been given the joy of the Lord in our hearts. And Jesus said I make my, he'll make our joy complete. And it's not just regular joy uh, that we experience when pleasant and good things happen for, uh, for us or to us. But it's, it's a joy that is full and complete that's not dependent upon circumstances of life. But it depends solely on the presence of Jesus in us. Our obedience is not to boost God's ego. Obedience to his commands is the pathway to joy and to fulfillment in life. Then in verse 12, he said, my command is this, to love each other. This is a team effort. A lot of times we forget about that. Everybody needs to pitch in. Everybody on the team has a role to play. There must be unity on a team. And the unity comes through love. I'm the chaplain at uh, Athens High, I mean, uh, Athens Academy uh, football team. And from the very beginning of preseason practice, which is going on right now, uh, we teach these boys, they got to love each other. Now, that sounds weird for a football team, doesn't it? <laughs> but we do. You have to Love and unity in that team is crucial to success of that team. Now, the Greek word that's used here is agape. And agape is not the emotion or feeling that we call love. Rather, it is an act of one's will. If we remain in the love of God, we will have the power to love each other. But it is something we have to decide to do. Love doesn't just happen unless we make it happen. Unless love is just not thinking inside, well, I really love her. It's showing that I love him, support him, and help him any way that I can. We do that with each other. It creates the unity because we intentionally love each other. <coughs> <coughs> Verses 14 and 15, he says, you're my friends. If you do what I command, I don't call you servants. Uh, you, you, he wants you to be his friend. Now, being God's friend, servant would be fine for me, wouldn't it, you? I mean, you use, use in reference to God uh, being a servant or a slave is a high honor. <coughs> Moses, Joshua, and David were all called the slaves or the servants of God. And that's pretty high cotton to walk in in my book. <clears throat> so the greatest biblical characters are called the slaves or servants of God. But Jesus said, no, <laughs> I've chosen you for something even greater, to be my friend, to be my confidant, to, to, uh, to, to the intimacy of friendship. Jesus chose us for that. What's important? If you're really a friend, whatever's important to you should be important to your friend. Whatever's important to Jesus ought to be important to us. Jesus said, I've called you friends and I've told you everything the Father told me. If you're really my friends, the things God said to me will be important to you also. Love one another. It's of utmost importance to be a friend of Jesus. Now let's turn to that overarching purpose I made for which God chose us. What is 
our purpose in life. Well, he made it real clear in six, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, as we learned last week, bearing fruit is a two-sided coin. It involves the growth and development of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, which will in turn produce fruit in the ministry of bringing others to faith in Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18, Paul <coughs> says that we are playing the game of reconciliation. He says God had reconciled the world to himself, and now he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. And we are God's ambassadors in the world, wherever we are in the world, we are God's ambassadors declaring God's truth to others and urging others to be reconciled to God. You know, this world we live in, everything in it is passing away, isn't it? I mean, it's, it ain't, it's not going to be this way forever. It's, it's passing away. Be reconciled to God. The word of God will not pass away. The only fruit that will last, which he says we're chosen for, to produce fruit that lasts, the only fruit that will last is that which comes from sowing the seed of God's word. The word is eternal. And when that word gets inside of us, it changes us. Amen. It changed me radically. And God begins to grow in us then, the fruit of his spirit in us. We begin to, uh, to have love, joy, peace, patience, kind of gentleness, self-control. And that begins to impact those around us as a witness to the world. And then comes the fruit. They want what you have. Peter says, set apart Christ in your heart as Lord. And always be ready to give account of your hope the hope you have to anyone who would ask you. If we're the happiest people on earth, they'll ask. They'll get around to it. The good news of reconciliation revealed in Jesus of Nazareth, whom we call the Christ, is what we are to be about. Now, the devil is busy recruiting players to join his rebellion against God in this ministry of reconciliation. Uh, but before God laid the foundation of this world, he chose us to be on his team. We are chosen to be partners with God in the ultimate victory over evil, over all of God's adversaries. Now, listen to Revelation chapter uh, 17, verse 14. It says, they, that is the enemies of God, they will make war against the Lamb, Jesus, but the Lamb will overcome him because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Now, I can't answer for you. That's the team I want to be on. Amen. We are called. We are chosen. Be a faithful follower of Jesus. We got to choose to get in the game. Not just play church, but get in the game. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise that you've given us something to do. You've chose us uh, to be involved in this ministry of reconciliation, to work with you shoulder to shoulder, to show the world your love and mercy that's offered to them in Jesus Christ. So help us, Lord, to receive, know, and understand your word. 
and to do our part each and every day to be ambassadors for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to start using this altar to pray, as I said last week. As we sing our last song, it's open. And there are a number of invitations that you give. Uh, the invitation to Christian discipleship. You may need to ask God for, for forgiveness. You, you may not have a personal relationship with Jesus. You may need to know your sins are forgiven and turn your life over to God. That's what this altar is for. You're sacrificing yourself to Jesus. If God re revealed to you an issue of life or faith that you need to pray about, come and pray. If you need healing in your mind, body, or spirit, or if you do need the joy of the Lord to help you drive some darkness from your life, please come. God will meet you here at this altar. Maybe that some here might uh, prompted uh, God might have prompted you to place your uh, membership in this local congregation. Come to the altar. Submit yourself to God and talk to me about that and we'll make that happen. Now, if, in the course of this praying, if, you, if you'd if like me to pray with you, if you lift your hand, I'll be glad to come and pray with you. And if not, I'll respect your privacy. Let you do your own business with God. So let's pray and praise and thank God for a wonderful day to honor our mothers. And what we'll have a whole week to honor God. Amen.